The Death of the Architect. What is going to be the final nail in the coffin of the architect? To my mind, it's not going to be because of any danger, of any risk, of surveillance, of the use of, of autonomous weapons, but something else, the very efficiency and capacity of AI itself. I'm showing you here uh, a project that has been on which Corp Himmelblau, the office in Vienna, the progressive office in Vienna, led by uh, Wolf Pricks, has been working for some time with Daniel Bolojan as the lead AI expert. Daniel Bolojan is a professor at Florida and um, Atlanta University in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and this is a project which has been used, has been using many forms of AI, um, style GANs, cycle GANs, and other other devices and techniques that are not been have not been fully disclosed to produce something that is really quite novel. This is what uh, you can hallucinate through AI and and produce some form of architecture totally automatically, totally automatically. This is one of the most uh, impressive and astonishing examples, but there is much more to come. If we are to believe Ben Bratton, we are still in the silent movies period of computation. In other words, think back about the silent, silent movies of you know, Charlie Chaplin and all those things, or even before Charlie Chaplin, there, Buster, uh, Buster Keaton and so on. They, things have moved on so much. If you think about the cars they had in, in the ages of the, uh, the age of, of, the, of the silent movies and what we have now, things have moved on, but we are still in the silent movies period of computation and even earlier when it comes to AI. So what will AI bring to us? What we can see now is just a shadow of the potential of what AI can do. That much we know. It is going to become even more powerful and even more impressive over the years. So what will happen to the architect when AI becomes really capable, when it really has that potential to automatically design buildings for us? What happens then? To my mind, the, the most useful analogy is that of the self-driving car. It's useful for many reasons. It's useful because it suggests that the way that change happens is incremental. Those of you who either own a, a Tesla or know people who own a Tesla will probably know already that the way that these things get uh, become self-driving is through upgrading of the software gradually, 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 until at one point you begin to realize that it is self-driving. It's a bit like boiling a frog. You just don't notice it. If you want to boil a frog, I've never boiled a frog, but apparently there's no point dropping into boiling water because it'll leap out again. Put the frog in, in some tepid water and gradually increase the heat, the frog will never notice. At least that's the theory. And this in many ways is, is, is a very useful way of thinking about what will happen with self-driving cars. Toby Walsh is a computer expert who wrote a book called um, Machines That Think. Actually, Machines That Think is a terrible title because machines don't think, right? They do not have consciousness. They do not think. They don't. There are a lot of things they don't do. But, and they, they might learn, but they don't learn the way that humans do and so on. Nevertheless, despite the title of the book, there are some interesting observations that he makes. He offers a series of predictions about the future, actually many of which are not very are quite, quite obvious in many ways. But the one I really like is his prediction about the future of the car. Now, what he makes, the comedy makes, it is going to be sort of a gradual process. And it'll be, there'll be a number of different factors involved in it that will dictate the fact that actually in the end, we won't be allowed to drive cars anymore and we will not notice or even care. His point is this, as self-driving cars become more convenient, and we'll probably find that Ubers and Lyfts and all those other kind of uh, vehicles uh, that constitute taxi these days, they will probably become self-driving too fairly soon. 
So as we self-driving cars become more uh, available, reliable, and frankly easier, we will use them more and more. But the consequence of that is as we use self-driving cars more and more, we will lose certain skills, namely the skill of driving. And that happens already. I mean, I, when I was young, I used to win the prize for choreography, for, 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 sorry, for, 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 sorry, for, for handwriting, um, calligraphy. I used to win the prize at school for handwriting. Now I type everything I can't even write. I can't read my own writing. We lose skills unless we keep developing, keep practicing them. So the point that Toby Walsh is making is that we will lose our driving skills. And what will be the consequence of that? It will be that insurance premiums will go up for people who insist on still driving their cars. And eventually you'll think, ah, it's more convenient to have a self-driving car. It's going to cost me too much anyway to get insured to go and drive my own car. I won't bother. And the beautiful comment about this is he said we will not notice or even care. It will gradually, gradually, gradually creep up on us and like the frog being boiled, we won't even notice it. Now you might object and say, of course we'll notice it. Of course we will see those things happening. But let me put to you the situation that I experienced myself when I was a student at the University of Cambridge, I can recall what it was like to go on a, on a holiday somewhere. First of all, I would queue up at SDA Travel, the student travel organization, and you'd wait in line. And then eventually you would give your details to someone behind the counter and tell them when you want to go and where you wanted, when you wanted to, to fly and where you wanted to fly to. Then she, he or she would give you a series of options and you would agree on one. And then you'd, um, you'd, you'd book the ticket. And two days later, it'd come to you by post. That's the way that it would happen. Meanwhile, you'd go off to a camera shop and you'd go and pick up some film to take with you. And then when you came back from your holiday, you would develop the film. You'd get it processed. Now, where are all those industries now? There are some travel agents, but most people book their flights online. And you might not have noticed, but travel agents have all but disappeared. Processing of films? They've completely gone. Nobody ever gets their films processed because we all have, have digital cameras now, or more importantly, we all have mobile phones, cell phones that have cameras every bit as good as the cameras we had in the past. Another victim then of this progress has been the camera shop. The high street, main street camera shop has all but disappeared. Now these things happened. I didn't really notice them. I just looked around and said, where have all the camera shops gone? Where have all the travel agents gone? It's fairly clear that this is going to be the logic of how things go. So let's think about architecture. Um, what has become clear, and I've just shown you the deep Himmelblau thing, that, that these AI, this, this AI can really generate interesting forms and do it in a very intelligent way. Um, there's still progress to be made, of course, but they can do those things. They can design buildings for us. Now, if you put out alongside other things that are happening today, where our, whereby our tastes have been all recorded as data somewhere, I mean, it's no coincidence that when you um, use Spotify, it knows what music you like because you've already told it what you like. When you go onto Amazon, look for a book or something, it knows what books you want and is suggesting something. When you're using Gmail, it will finish off your sentences for you because it knows how you like to write to finish off your sentences. AI can track and record all your preferences. Your, the advertisements sent to you are customized for you. The news it will very soon all be customized for your particular kind of taste and so on and so on. AI can customize things precisely according to what you want. In other words, it's not simply a question of whether a, a, um, AI can design a building. It will be able to customize a building precisely according to your tastes. And then let's put this in context. An architect, architects increasingly will be expected to use AI. That's already the case. Already clients are saying, 
we want you to use AI. And why are they asking this? Why are they requesting this? Because AI guarantees the maximum return on investment, at least it can do. The client wants to know that, that he or she is getting the most out of the site available and that the building being designed is going to consume the least energy as possible. AI is useful for finding the best solutions. So increasingly, architects are going to do the same. They're going to use AI. And what's more, if they don't use AI, the chances are that as with drivers, their insurance premiums will go in, go up. Their professional indemnity payments will go up because they're not protecting themselves by using AI, which will be looking out for risk and will be maximizing the, the return on investment. At some point then, uh, most clients are going to say, well, I don't, uh, I won't, don't need an architect because the architects are priced them out of existence. There may well still be the case, and I'm sure there will be, there will be certain star architects who will be employed because they, they will cost more. Obviously, they will cost more. But the logic of branding is that you don't really pair, care about cost. In fact, you want to flaunt the fact you don't care about cost. If you've got a Prada bag or Gucci or whatever, you know it's expensive and you know that everyone else knows it's expensive and that's precisely where you got it, it why you, you have it in order to flaunt your wealth. So I'm sure there will still be a place for certain architects and also for, for, for certain architects, star architects because the client wants to be able to display how they've commissioned a, a very famous architect. And also one could say that maybe in other cultures, less advanced technological cultures, this these advances are not going to happen at pace with advanced Western societies. But nonetheless, it's clear to me that this is the way that we are heading. The very triumph of AI, the very capacity of AI to produce such amazing buildings will, the very bright side, the, 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 the bright side of AI will also potentially be the dark side of AI. Here is a, an analysis done by Wen Yu Her of X Cool about how she sees the way um, things are going to be operating. If you can see this graph as kind of the amount of effort put in, uh, we started off with humans and initially it was it was human beings doing all the work and eventually, according to her, her um, um, prediction, it's going to be machines doing all the work and I can imagine that. But according to her graph, this is going to be the consequence of that is humans have more time. They will be able to go and um, do other things, spend more time on the design process and so on, because the machines do all the, the menial work for us. And that's certainly the view of, of, of architects such as uh, Wolf, Wolf Pricks from Gold Pimmelblau. He imagined the possibility of going off to some, some island somewhere and, and having a holiday while AI is doing all the work. I would question that. I would question that because I'm not so sure that clients will put up with that. My, I'm, more, I'm more convinced that actually as, as was predicted um, elsewhere, um, that in fact, what's going to happen by, by, by Ford and, his, and the rise of the robots is that actually because of competition, no one's going to be paying for, for, for Wolf Pricks to go on his holiday. They're going to be basically thinking, I can get this done more efficiently um, by using these machines. And this, to my mind, is going to be the result, not that there's going to be more time for human beings to enjoy the spoils of AI. This led me to um, the, the, the conclusion of the first book that I did on AI, which is actually about the positive side of AI, looking at all the achievements that AI can do. Um, and there are many ways in which it will help. Um, it will help the way that we operate. Uh, it will alleviate traffic in, 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 in cities. Uh, it will operate in a way that we don't, facial recognition means we won't have to carry passports, keys, credit cards, and cash around because everything be recognized by face and so on and so on, that this will be an incredibly useful development, incredibly useful. And increasingly, of course, um, clients will be, will insist their architects use AI, which is already happening. And architects will start branding themselves much as they do now in terms of their sustainability, in terms of the use of AI. And finally, number 10, AI will become, will become able to generate and customize designs completely autonomously. You don't need an architect. It will know what we want and it will achieve it. That is, on the one hand, the most incredibly successful achievement of AI, the kind of crowning glory in some ways, but it also spells 
the end of the architect. When you have a self-driving car, you don't need a driver. And when you have AI that's become so proficient that it's able to know what you want and give it to you without the intervention of any architect, then you don't need an architect. Game over.